Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. In just two days, newly selected White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer will travel west to speak at the University of Chicago, one of this nation's most prestigious and expensive colleges. He's coming at the invitation of longtime Obama aide David Axelrod. The topic, of course, is politics and the presidential campaign. But not everyone on campus believes Spicer should be allowed to talk in public. They argue that by inviting a Trump supporter to campus, the school is, quote, normalizing the incoming administration. Some students are threatening to shut down the event entirely. One of those joins us now. He is University of Chicago senior Jake Biddle. He's also an editor of a local weekly paper. Jake, thanks for coming on tonight. Thanks so, for having me, Tucker. I like your tie. So uh, you have you wrote on Facebook um, that you wanted to shut this thing down, and you suggested projectile vomiting uh, during the event, which I assume is a joke. Uh, but the idea was that this guy, Sean Spicer, should not be allowed to speak. And I, I read a lot of what you wrote about it, and one of your explanations was, well, he represents a press operation that is hostile to freedom of speech and to the freedom of the press, therefore he, he shouldn't be allowed to talk. There seems an irony in that. He's against freedom of speech, so you don't let him talk? How does that work? Sure. Uh, so what I, what I was saying was not that he shouldn't be allowed to talk. Rather, what I was saying was that I, as a student, and y yes, it was a joke when I said that I was I going assume. to projectile vomit on him, although I'm glad that I made it because now I get to explain what I meant to you. So what I meant was that I, as a student, and my peers should be allowed to respond to his presence on my campus in ways that aren't just civil or decorous and don't involve just sort of standing up after the event and asking him a question. Although I never said he should be disinvited, and I never said he shouldn't be allowed to talk. But, but in ways that involve force, I mean, it sounds like. I mean, so when you say we should be allowed to respond, how about the traditional path, which is to make a counter case? You disagree with what he stands for, which is, of course, fine. And you say, this is what I stand for, and may the best man win. You don't believe in that, it seems like. Sure. So Sean Spicer was hired and is paid to have certain opinions and to support certain policies about the press. He has power, a national platform. He's in the news every day. And he has access right. to policymaking power. If I stand up and ask him a question and say, Sean, have you ever considered that you might be a fascist? He can give me a smarmy answer. It lasts 20 seconds, and I don't get a follow-up, and then what do I do? I'm saying I would like to raise visibility and voice my frustrations with this person in ways that aren't sort of going to die after 20 seconds, and he gives me, you know, sort of a non-answer. He's well, a spin but doctor. That's a, but, I mean, you know? but, that's a, but that's a stupid question, though. Why are you a fascist? I mean, I'm not even sure we could agree on what that yeah, means. That was, yeah. How okay. about, how about yeah, specific? That's, that's like, fair. you believe this. You're in favor of this policy. Here's why I think it's mm -hmm. wrong or hurts America. Yeah. Make your case. And in all the social media sure. of yours that I've read today, I haven't seen you doing that. I, instead, and you're clearly smart, I've seen you calling names, which seems to be kind of the way people respond now. Would it be better to make a case? Sure. So, I mean... I think that no matter what kind of case I make and no matter how good of a point I make to him, he has no reason to listen to me and no incentive to listen to me. I mean, this isn't about who's right. It's about who has power. And so I think that students in this country need to mobilize in ways that would actually get people that we like in office instead of sort of discussing in sanitized environments and, you know, in moderated conversations. Does that make sense? It, it sort of does. And just to help you elucidate it more, I want to put on the screen something that you wrote in your school newspaper. Um, sure. recently, the independent school newspaper, you said this. Now we are faced with a real crisis, this being the election of Trump. We must take real action and dispense with all this sophistry, all these abstract notions of civility, which are just Ivy League translations of the vulgar give Trump a chance. By real action, I mean donating money to the ACLU, to Standing Rock, to Planned Parenthood, calling your representative incessantly, protesting obsessively, flipping cars when Trump walks away from the Paris Climate Agreement, attacking racists you see, attacking people in the supermarket, whatever it takes. So I've got a bunch of questions about this, but the first is, whose cars would you flip? Uh, I don't know yet. I mean, it depends on whether or not he walks away from the Paris Climate Accords. I mean, I think that if you dwell on the sort of more uh, exaggerated or hyperbolic parts of this article, which is, after all, just an article, you're not going to get a chance to actually ask me what I think political action constitutes. I mean, all that this is meant to express, Tucker, is that whoa, whoa, wait, I wait think a second. that... You were, you were okay. just explaining what it... I mean, first of all, let me say, having read things you've written going back to, you know, high school, because you've written a lot, you're a pretty articulate person with a command, a precise command of the language, and presumably in an article this long, you could explain exactly what that action what form it would take. And in this case, you said it takes flipping cars over. And my point is, someone paid for those cars. Like, those aren't your cars. And to destroy other people's property to make your political point isn't really a valid path, is it? Well, well, first of all, they flipped cars when the Cubs won. But secondly, Tucker, I mean, so I think that 
Yeah, it's, it's an article, and I exaggerated. But, I mean, I, I'm trying to explain now what I think I actually mean by uh, political action that doesn't consist in sort of sanitized or moderated Q&A sessions or bipartisan roundtables at the, at the Institute of Politics. And I think that you want to say that this way of uh, engaging in politics is sort of a young, petulant thing among closed-minded liberals. But really, the sort of ancestry of this kind of action is, is the Tea Party. I mean, they staged massive demonstrations. They uh, called their representatives incessantly. And they uh, got people that they wanted in office through a grassroots mobilization. I mean, there was right. big money involved. But, but frankly, there was a lot of political participation in that. Right. And so I don't think that it's fair to say that what I'm doing is sort of uh, catastrophic or intolerant, when really what I'm trying to argue is that young people need to be politically mobilized in ways that don't just involve talking and asking questions and going back and forth. And like knowing things. So like what about the Paris peace, uh, climate agreement do you, do you like so much? So if, the, if America were not to participate in this climate, in, in this climate accord, uh, carbon levels would rise so much in, this, in the world that it would sort of put us past the point where we can bring it back down in a safe or efficient way. <laughs> that suggests you know nothing yeah. about it. But let, let me just ask you this. Don't you Tucker, think... just because I don't have the numbers on it doesn't mean I don't no, know anything about it. No, no, no. I'm saying, it. look, I mean, if you're going to... Here's my point. Is that you are... You're the editor of a weekly paper. People listen to you. And rather than explain, you know, here's why you ought to support the Paris climate agreement, your position is, if you don't believe everything I think I believe, even if I have no details, then I'm going to flip your car over. I'm going to, set, I'm going to vomit on you. you. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to commit an act of violence. I'm going to beat you up in a supermarket. That's not really debate. T That's something dumber, Tucker, no? Tucker, how could I possibly make the case to the Trump administration that he ought not to walk away from the Paris Climate Accords? I don't what know about, by knowing what it is. What, <laughs> I mean, that what might about, help, but don't you think? What about the, how could I possibly make a point in a way that would make him want to listen to me? I mean, it's not about sort of who can make better points. And who, this guy has a platform. He... It has, he has control of the country and can do whatever he wants, no matter what he wants. It's not about whether I can convince him and his right. administration that it's wrong. It's about whether I can make sure that he feels enough pressure that he won't do it and doom the future of our planet. So what, what you're articulating isn't politics, it's nihilism. You're saying that none no, of this matters. No, Tucker, all that's kabuki, absolutely wrong. And whoever has the Tucker, gun is the guy in charge. That's basically what you're saying. Tucker, no, that's exactly what I'm not saying. I'm saying that I have convictions, and I would like to express them on terms that are not set by my opponent. Do you understand what I mean? Right. Well, I think we can all agree on these terms. Rational, elucidated, facts-based debate carries the day. And if you don't agree with that, and if you think vandalism carries the day, then we can't really have a conversation because we're just starting from places that are so different that it's not even worth it, right? Right. So, so you want to say that I won't hear the other side out and I won't participate in a rational debate. But the question <laughs> yeah. is, how, how could I possibly participate in a rational debate with someone who literally controls the country? I mean, think about this for a second. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, I'm not I sure agree vomiting that... on him is going to be the, the answer to that. Well, that might diminish well, you. You. You, established this, you established this segment by telling me that that was a joke, and I agree with well, you. I, so I, I don't know why we're well, proceeding. Because I, I think, look, I'm almost out of time. Let me just say this last thing. I think you're smart. You probably have valid points of view. Maybe I disagree with them. But it might be better to explain what they are rather than start with, hey, if you don't like it, I'm going to hit you in the face, which is where you're starting from. That's fair, Tucker. But I, I mean, I, I just I think that you've sort of skirted around what my actual point is. And I mean, like you've it read couldn't. my writings going back to high school. You should know that there's a tradition of hyperbole in writing that goes back, what, yeah. to juvenile? No, I got the, I got the Hunter Thompson thing. But facts count, too. Jake, thanks a lot for joining us. I appreciate huh? it.